attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening and welcome to the latest ReproAction Act and Learn webinar, Why Pro-Life Feminism is Just Not Possible. We're grateful you're here to join us tonight. So first, um, we'll introduce your host. Uh, the first voice you hear is me, Erin Matson. I'm based in Arlington, Virginia, and I'm one of the co-founders and co-directors of ReproAction. And I am Pamela Merritt. I am based in St. Louis, Missouri, and I am the other co-founder and co-director of ReproAction. Early Tuesday morning, police shot and killed Alton Sterling, a 37-year-old father of five. Today, the loss of this black life is felt nationally as, again, police violence is responsible for the devastation of black families and communities. We reject all justification for this murder and for police killings of black people and people of color. We embrace wholeheartedly Alton Sterling's family, community, and the city of Baton Rouge as they grieve and demand justice. Please pause. Um, with us for a moment of silence in honor of Alton Sterling. Thank you very much. Tonight's agenda for the webinar um, is going to be a quick introduction to who we are and what ReproAction is all about. Um, then we're going to go into why pro-life and feminism don't mix. Following that, lies and sex-selective abortion bans. And then we'll cover some myths and facts then there'll be a Q&A on pro-life feminist um, movements and tactics with Hannah Groach Begley. And then a Q&A on pro-life feminist whiteness and their mission with Imani Gandhi from Rewire. Um, after that, we'll have next steps. We'll have audience Q&A and then we'll close promptly at 8 um, o'clock Eastern. The hashtag for live tweeting this webinar is ReproAction. So RepoAction is a new direct action group forming to increase access to abortion and advance reproductive justice. We are proud of our left flank analysis, of our willingness to hold folks on all sides accountable, whether they identify as allies or they are the opposition. And we are proud of our commitment to nonviolent direct action. All right, so first we're gonna shore this up with some basic, um, basic information about why pro-life views and feminism don't mix. We want to be very clear, unequivocally clear, that there is no such thing as a pro-life feminist. And here is why. Feminism is an action agenda working toward the political, social, and legal equality of women. Women simply can't be equal when their bodies sexuality, and reproduction are shamed or restricted under the law. And that's why we say that pro-life and feminism don't mix. Certainly, you can choose to not have abortions and be a feminist. You cannot, however, shame or work to restrict the choices of other women and be a feminist, even if you claim to be doing it for their own good. So saving women from themselves is paternalism and not feminism. And on that note, we just want to offer a simple reminder that there is absolutely nothing wrong with abortion, pregnancy, and sexuality. It's something that women should be in control of. So we wanted to answer that question because it's very common that you'll hear people say, well, can't you be a pro-life feminist? Why, why can't you be? And when you look at a definition of pro-life, 
in the sense that it's actually used, which is used to either shame or work to restrict the access to abortion, that's a problem. It's it's one thing to say you can't have, you're not going to have abortions yourself and you want to be a feminist. That's fine. But you certainly can't work against the right to abortion for others. So we want to talk about, so what is this thing, pro-life feminism, that they're trying to create on the other side now? So let's dive a little bit backward and go into the history. So it's, uh, for a long time, um, the pro-life movement used a focus on the fetus and the supposed immorality of sexuality. But in recent years, certain factions of the pro-life movement have tried quite hard to pivot from the sexism and male dominance at the core of their beliefs and their leadership. Now you'll hear those factions trying to strike a compassionate tone and using woman-centered language rather than a focus on a fetus or on the immorality of sexuality. And so you hear, you'll, you'll see, and they talk about this sometimes in, within that movement. They'll say, well, let's focus on trying to talk about compassion toward women and, and stop calling women murderers. Um, so there, it's, a, it's an attempt to shift in tone. They are trying to present more women as spokespeople, although it remains very much the case that men are in large part the leadership of this movement. Um, you'll often hear them evoking the legacies of suffragists of women who fought hard, who fought very hard, who in some cases were jailed and arrested um, for the right to vote and pulling their quotes out of context. You'll also often hear them placing a hyper focus on black women in particular. They'll have black women in their imagery. They'll often appropriate Black Lives Matter language in addition to the feminist language that they're appropriating and they'll often put a focus on Planned Parenthood health centers in black communities. Currently, they're trying to say they are the true feminists. Again, going back to the evoking legacies of suffragists and pulling quotes out of context. And a perfect example of that, by the way, is Susan B. Anthony List. Susan B. Anthony List, um, Susan B. Anthony, the suffragist, never advocated for abolition of abortion in the sense that that organization does. And she fought for the right to vote. And so it seems if there were truly an organization with integrity that called itself the Susan B. Anthony List, it would be working against voter suppression, not working against women's rights to control their own bodies. Um, now, well, as, they, as they do try to say that they are the true feminists, they'll make a number of claims. They'll make claims that abortion hurts women. So they'll, they'll use their tried and true argument about the fetus, and at the same time now they're trying to incorporate the woman. So you'll often see the phrase, protect them both, being used by these factions of the pro-life movement. They'll claim that abortion kills girls, uh, and they put a particular focus on doubting and restricting women of color with sex selection bans, and we'll dive into that more shortly. And they'll also claim that abortion means society is not fulfilling a woman's need. So with that, I'm going to pass it back to Pamela. Thank you, Erin. Um, so now we're going to go into um, the lies and select sex-selective abortion bans. So these are just some examples of the imagery that Erin referenced earlier. Sex, select, sex selective abortion bans. So seven states currently ha ban abortion on the basis of fetal sex. Pro-life advocates have pushed a federal ban on sex selective abortions, claiming the mantle of equality and civil rights. And as Aaron mentioned, very often appropriating the language of the civil rights movement in um, that push. Pro-life feminist organizations like the Charlotte Lozier Institute say feminists, reproductive rights activists ignore what they call gender side, um, which is also um, very insulting um, in appropriating all of the emotion and um, horror that's surrounding um, genocide. These bans codify discrimination based on race and national origin, placing doubt on women of color. So 
in, in the name of helping and advocating for women of color and indeed what they're doing is benefiting from a, a source, a well well documented source of discrimination and bigotry towards women of color, particularly involving sexual autonomy. And these bans do not address the root cause uh, of um, preference, misogyny, and patriarchy. Uh, Here's some myths that we're going to, oh, I'm sorry. I took your slide, Erin. <laughs> all good. I'm happy to happy to share. Um, there are unfortunately uh, so many pro-life feminist myths that I'm sure there's plenty to go around between the two of us. Um, but I will get started. So, and by the way, there are. If you want more of this, feel free to go to our uh, campaign website, whoisclosingabortionclinics.org, where we have a lot more of this information. But we want to go through some of these common myths and facts, uh, myths that uh, the pro-life movement is trying to promote as somehow feminist justification, supposedly feminist justifications for restricting women's basic autonomy, equality, and dignity. So one example of a myth is, as Feminists for Life has stated, women deserve better than abortion. The fact is that women don't deserve better than abortion. Abortion is a safe medical procedure. Access to abortion affirms autonomy for each woman in this country. Access to abortion puts women in control of their reproductive futures. Lila Rose from Live Action has said that the only true feminist is a pro-life feminist. But the fact is that true feminists recognize that abortion is an empowering act, that women are capable of making their own choices, and that actively stripping people of decision-making powers is violence. And I want to dig into that, um, that bit and just remind people that 95% of women do not uh, report, in, in fact, they, they report relief about their abortions. So this idea that women regret their abortions is a total myth and a lie. Um, so another myth here, they say Charlotte Lozier Institute says that those who claim to be concerned with women's rights can no longer ignore the need to ban sex-selective abortion in order to protect girls from gender side. The fact is that many pro-life feminists have supported legislation that would ban abortion on the basis of the fetus's sex, while ignoring cultural factors that beget sex-selective abortion, such as the devaluing of women in all societies. Another myth. The Susan B. Anthony list says that Americans, America's abortion laws are among the most permissive on the planet. The fact is that 90% of counties in the U.S. don't have abortion providers. This statement is absolutely absurd. More than half the states in this country require women to wait an insulting, expensive, and inaccessible 24 and 72 hours before exercising their constitutional right to abortion. 17 states require physicians to disseminate false information, and across the board, People accessing reproductive health care and those who provide it face harassment, stigma, and violence. Another myth is this idea from Christy Burton Brown of Live Action is that only a pro-life feminist believes in the most basic right for all women, the right to live. The fact is that pro-life feminists do not seem to believe in the right to live for women facing life-threatening pregnancies. In fact, the, uh, the, the leader of live action, Lila Rose, has lied, flat out lied, and said abortion is never necessary to save a woman's life when we know that is not true and we know that women have died as a result of being denied life-saving abortions that they begged for in the hospital, as in the case of Sabita Halapanavar in Ireland. Another example of when they talk about this most basic right for all women, the right to live, do they believe in the right for black trans women to live free of violence, for example? Epidemic rates of homicide against trans women of color and against people of color is not something the pro-life movement has ever bothered to address. We don't see them showing up on a variety of issues, whether it's maternal mortality, infant mortality, gun violence, and so it's simply a lie. Um, and with that, I am going to move to, 
unmute Hannah Groach Bagley. Hannah is here with us from Washington, D.C. She is the research director at the SCOTUS Project um, from NARAL Pro Choice America, and I think she has one of the best Twitter handles of all time. She is Grouchy Bagels. Hannah, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me, and I'm glad you like my Twitter handle. It means a lot. <laughs> my pleasure. So my first question for you, I'm going to back up a bit. So the recent SCOTUS case, the decision we just had in Whole Woman's Health, the Hellerstedt, was based on HB2, this Texas law that that forced dozens of abortion clinics to close for no good reason. And it was based on false claims of the proponents of their concern, their supposed concern for women's health and safety, when no such benefit was proven by forcing abortion clinics to close. This is something that was noted in Justice Breyer's majority opinion that they had no evidence of a single woman who had benefited under this law. And the opinion also noted that you just simply can't make stuff up and expect that to fly. So in this context, it's it's very important to talk about this, this, um, this assertion of concern for women's health and safety and this assertion of concern for women. I know that you study pro-life women and the pro-life movements and arguments about women every day in your job. Can you give us an overview of what you've learned or things that we should know? Sure. Um, it's a big, big question. But um, I think what we've seen is that this rhetoric from the pro-life movement um, that tries to frame their legislation um, and their activities as pro-women's health um, has always uh, been a ruse, obviously. And what's really exciting about what happened with the Supreme Court is that the Supreme Court saw through that rhetoric. Um, you know, women have seen through that rhetoric for years now, but it's something they've really been pushing for decades, that they think they can lie about um, how they're going to restrict clinics and how they're going to restrict women's bodies by framing it as this women's health package. Um, and they, they were successful in that, to be honest, for several years. And what's exciting about what's happening right now is we're seeing that start to fail. Um, and so as we study the pro-life movement, and particularly this um, you know, subgroup of pro-life feminists, as they call themselves, uh, we have to really pay attention to how that rhetoric is changing now that they are um, realizing that that may not be as effective a talking point anymore. Um, and so a lot of what I do is really trying to focus on um, what is this latest version of this rebrand? What do they mean when they use the word feminism? Um, and, and how how best can we really reveal their true intentions? Yeah, thanks for that. And I'm really interested in digging in more on this idea of what do they mean when they try to claim or, or more bluntly, appropriate the, le the label of feminism. Do you see them advocating for other feminist causes, or is it just a label that they're wrapping around their pro-life views? It's really a label, um, and it's really uh, an example of them using a lot of language and a lot of terms um, from sort of the history of feminism to really try to co-opt um, and appropriate those terms for their own purposes. Uh, so example, in not just beyond just using the, the feminist word, right, is also um, they recently held a conference in Dallas uh, which they branded online as their version of Seneca Falls. Um, they talk a lot about, uh, you know, being um, not just feminist, but but also um, pro women in in language that is very reminiscent of sort of second wave feminism from the '80s and um, and '70s. And and that I think is fascinating. Um, that what they're doing is they're they're, you know trying to rebrand the pro-life movement, which has a very tarnished brand at this point, which is sort of known for being extreme, known for being very violent. They're trying to move away from that by appropriating language from an older version of feminism. And I just want to pause on that for a second, because when we talk about what pro-life feminism is, what we're talking about is a feminism that would be very familiar to people who study 
sort of the second wave of feminism, um, particularly what's called essentialism. And what that means is it's it's a uh, uses the term feminism to talk very specifically about um, women as biologically different from men. Right? It's a uh, it's about focusing on women's bodies. Women are um, who they are because they have a uterus, because they have ovaries, because they have breasts, and they are who they are because they give birth. And that was an that's an older version of feminism um, that was um, you know popular for a time, uh, but you know I think wisely uh, feminists have moved away from that to understand that when we focus on women's bodies to that extent, we really you know we leave out obviously as you mentioned uh, trans populations. Who deserve our support and and activism and inclusion? Uh, we we leave out you know, leave out women who who have just had hysterectomies before, right? For medical reasons, you leave out women who um, maybe don't want to have children, and that's just a personal choice they're making. And it really goes back to this shaming of women to be a particular kind of woman, and so. You know, modern feminism, um, what's sort of referred to as the third wave of feminism, has understood the problems inherent in that rhetoric. What the pro-life movement is doing is they're trying to co-opt that older version of feminism. They're trying to say, we are the really pro-women groups because we respect that women should really be at home and having babies. And once you dig into that a little bit more and you realize that they are completely unable to um, get beyond women as just baby making machines, you realize that that doesn't sound at all like feminism. It, in fact, it doesn't even sound like what the second waivers intended. Um, but in particular, their their language and their their rebrand has no room for trans women or trans men. Um, it has no room for anyone who just wants to access basic medical care and make choices about their own body. Indeed. And, and when you look at, you know, who is working to restrict the rights of trans women and trans men, it's often the very same communities. Um, but fundamentally, this is about trying to, uh, to assign to people what they can and can't do on the basis of the body they were born into. Just one thing I want to um, add in there is that the second wave feminist uh, movement was it was and is uh, those those factions of it that are still going and uh, very um, opposed to restrictions on reproductive rights. And so um, that's something that yes. I consider as well. Um, so, and by the way, everyone, feel free to type in questions in the chat box. We'll get to as many of your questions at the end as we can. Feel free to do it throughout this presentation. Um, so I've got a couple more minutes here with Hannah and then we'll pass it over to Pamela and Imani, and then we'll get as many questions as possible. But my next question for you, Hannah, is just how do the people who call themselves pro-life feminists interact with the rest of the movement? Because let's be honest, this movement has a lot of dudes. Yes, it does. Well, and I think that that goes to your point about them being the people who are also fighting against trans issues, right? That they're all actually the same, and they're all actually working very closely together. Um, what we're seeing with the pro-life feminist rebrand is this subgroup of the pro-life movement that's really trying to distance itself um, when it comes to their rhetoric and their outward appearance from the more extreme, the more male factions of the pro-life movement, right? That they're trying to say, no, we're the really, we're the moderate ones, we're the ones who, um, you know, other women can get along with and can talk to and we're not those scary dudes over there. Except that when you do my job and you dig into who these people are, you realize that they're actually all working incredibly close together. Um, for example, uh, just off the top of my head, and then there were none, which is one of the main groups that's trying to push this uh, pro-life feminist rhetoric, is very, very close with Operation Rescue and Troy Newman, who are sort of uh, I think one of the best examples of the old guard of the pro-life movement, um, extremely uh, out there, uh, supporting of a lot of violence, in particular supporting um, the murderers of abortion doctors, right? So when you start to realize that these are all the same people, they're friends, they um, you know, tag each other in Facebook photos, literally, it, it, it is that easy to identify these links, you start to realize that this rebrand is, is nothing more than rhetoric. Um, and it also goes to who's funding the fights against LGBT equality, right? So the funders 
who tried to fight marriage equality um, or the same funders who are fighting against abortion rights. The, they're the same people who are attacking uh, trans people. They're in particular trans women of color, right? Those groups are all receiving the same money and they're all receiving the same talking points. Mm -hmm. So my last question to you. So you've been talking about pro-life feminists trying to rebrand their, their deeply misogynist movement, right? The overall mm -hmm. pro-life movement. Who are their targets in this rebranding? And what are those talking points that they're using toward those targets? So this really goes to what I was saying earlier um, in terms of their talking points is they're really trying to focus on sort of women's bodies and, and really try to hide the fact that the whole point of their activism is to restrict women's bodies, right? So their talking points lately are focusing more on celebrating women's bodies and celebrating the fact that women have children. And, um, and we're not going to talk about how we're going to control that. We're just, we're just going to celebrate that. And what they're really doing is they're trying to target um, women who are younger, who um, you know, maybe self-identify as feminists, maybe self-identify as progressive, but who maybe don't have abortion as their number one priority or who aren't um, thinking a lot about reproductive rights and reproductive freedom. So that's a very... Uh, privileged group of young women. Um, that's a, particularly a very white group of young women, speaking as a young white woman, right? The kind of person who can be kind of blasé about whether or not they have access to birth control, whether or not they have access to abortion. That's a very specific segment of our population in general. Um, and, and they're really trying to target those people um, and, and sort of, I think in many ways, trick them into supporting this movement that is at its heart about controlling women. Um, and so that's really their their main focus right now. Mm. Mm. Well, this has been a fascinating discussion. Thank you so much, Hannah. I'm going to put you on mute. Please type questions or thoughts in the chat box. We'll get to as many of them as we can. Um, thank you again, Hannah. I'm putting you on mute. And now I'm going to unmute Imani and pass it over to Pamela. Thank you so much. So um, we're going to have a Q&A with Imani Gandhi um, on pro-life feminist whiteness and their mission. Imani is in the Bay Area, senior legal analyst for Rewire um, and co-host of This Week in Blackness Prime and another fantastic Twitter handle, Angry Black Lady. Um, so welcome, Imani. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you very much for having me. So let's dive right in, shall we? Um, I want to point out that um, Imani Gandhi has an award-winning piece on um, Margaret Sanger and kind of just deep dive into debunking a lot of the myths about um, Margaret Sanger as a white supremacist. So I have to ask you, um, and that was published with Rewire. Um, so. Many pro-life feminists argue that Planned Parenthood is inherently racist because they say Margaret Sanger, who founded Planned Parenthood, is a white supremacist. How do you see these arguments and others about protecting black women as a pro-life feminist tactic? Well, I mean, first of all, I have to say that Margaret Sanger was not a white supremacist. Um, for her time, she actually held a lot of forward-thinking views about race and about the ways in which white supremacy was related to racial strife, not only here in, in, in America, but also in far-flung places like India. So this, this sort of essentialist view that Margaret Sanger was a white supremacist is a way, is the primary tactic that, that the that anti-choicers and pro-life feminists use in order to shame black women. So the theory goes, you know, Margaret Sanger was a white supremacist and she wanted to exterminate all black people, and how can you support an organization that was founded by a woman who wanted to exterminate your race? And even if she, even if that were true, let's assume that all of that is true. She was a raging racist who wanted to murder all black people. This country was founded by raging racists who wanted to either murder all black people or enslave them all. So to demand that black women, black people in this country, you know, disassociate ourselves from systems, institutions, people that were founded in white supremacy is necessarily asking us to discount and disassociate ourselves 
from this country. And you know, as soon as someone says something like that, for example, Michelle Obama saying, this is the first time I've been proud to be an American, or the first time I've been proud to be in this country, or whatever it was that she said back in 2008, then the cries of, anti, of, of unpatriotic come out, right? And so you're mm -hmm. unpatriotic, and you should go back to where you came from, as if people have forgotten that we were kidnapped from where we came from, and brought here, and forced to work, and forced to breed, and forced to build not only this economy, but the global economy. So. I reject out of hand any nonsense that black women should feel ashamed about using Planned Parenthood um, health care services, including abortion services, because Planned Parenthood was founded by a racist. Now, to move on to whether I whether or not was actually found she was actually a racist, I think that there is a really big difference between being like a capital R, you know, trademark racist and being racist and then being and then saying racist stuff. Mm -hmm. And Margaret Sanger was probably a little a little R racist, and she definitely said a lot of racist stuff, but she wasn't a capital R T M in parentheses racist. And that's because she spoke very candidly about a lot of sort of racially um forward thinking. Um she she made a lot of racially forward thinking statements. For example, in, in an interview that is very infrequently cited by anyone, much less anyone who likes to claim that Margaret Sanger was some horrible demon, um, she gave an interview with Earl Conrad of the Chicago Defender in 1945, wherein she said, "Quote: Discrimination is a worldwide thing. It has to be opposed everywhere. That is why I feel the Negro's plight here is linked with that of the oppressed around the globe." The big answer, as I see it, is the education of the white man. The white man is the problem. It is the same as with the Nazis. We must change the white attitudes. That is where it lies. Um, in, another, in that same article, she describes this encounter that she had with a racist white man who um, knew about her sort of birth control crusade and wanted her to set up shop like in black neighborhoods in an effort to eradicate them. And so she says, when we first started out, an when we first started out, an anti-Negro white man offered me ten thousand dollars if I started in Harlem first. His idea mm -hmm. was simply to cut down the number of Negroes, spread it as far as you can among them. Birth control, he said. That is, of course, not our idea. I turned him down. But that is an example of how vicious some people can be about this thing, and this thing being her birth control crusade. So, uh, you know, it's un it's sort of understandable that people would have this view, and I frankly did not have a very clear view of the person she was until I spent time, you know, researching her in order to write this article. But the fact of the matter is, is that um, she was very, very heavily involved in the eugenics movement. And the eugenics movement, there were sort of two sides of the eugenics movement. There were the people who definitely, absolutely wanted to use birth control in order to weed out inferior stock, and that inferior stock included racial categories, and then there were people like Margaret Sanger who also spoke a lot about inferior stock, and that's a horrible ableist thing to say, but her, her vision of inferior stock had to do with people who were quote unquote morons, quote unquote, and, and imbeciles, and these were medical terms that, that were used at the time, like you can find them in the DSM, that were used to, to, to categorize and define people who had mental, mental, um, hand, mental uh, uh, disabilities of some sort. So. You know, it's a complicated conversation to have about what kind of person Margaret Sanger was. She was horribly ableist. She was very racially paternalistic. She did a lot of things. She uh, a lot of bad things. She said a lot of bad things. She she uh, aligned herself with a lot of bad people. She was sort of you know obsessed with her birth control crusade to such a such a degree that she had no problem making common cause with a lot of unpalatable people, including people who wanted to exterminate black people you know, from the planet through the use of birth control, including going to speak in New Jersey in 1930-something to the quote-unquote ladies of the KKK, because she thought, you know, what better way to spread birth control than to go and speak to the most powerful political group in the country? And that's mm -hmm. what the Ku Klux Klan was at that time, the most powerful political group in the country, something like four of our presidents were KKK members. So I really need to... You know, and then these are people that you know, pro-life feminists or anti-choicers would never say, "Oh, that person was a racist or that person was an evil person," such that they need to be discounted whole cloth the way they say about Margaret Sanger because she gave a speech in front of the KKK. So, you know, and, and I don't want to sit here and sound like I'm defending her because, like I said, I, I, she held a lot of truly deplorable beliefs, but mm -hmm. at the same time, a lot of the things that she said and the things that are attributed to her are things that she got by working with black people in the black leaders in the black community 
people like W. E. B. Du Bois and Adam Clayton um, uh, Adam Clayton Powell and you know uh, 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 Mary McLeod Bethune. These are all people that were involved in helping her spread birth control to the South because their concern was that you know Northern blacks, Northern black women, had all of the access to birth control that they needed, but but the birth control movement had sort of passed by Southern black women, and there was a uh, there was a strong need for birth control, birth control education in the South. So, yeah, I, I just. You know, whenever anti-choicers like to come at me, well, how can you support Planned Parenthood because Margaret Singer was a racist? I just say, you know what? This country was built by racists. I don't care. The issue is what does Planned Parenthood do now? And the issue <laughs> is how much are you as a quote-unquote pro-life feminist or an anti-choicer, how much do you really care about black people the way that you say that you do? And how much of it is just you being paternalistic, you mm -hmm. you know pushing stereotypes about black women being too stupid to know what's good for them? So that's why they're supporting this corrupt, horrible organization that is Planned Parenthood. Mm -hmm. um, I I cannot recommend. Um, could you could you say the title of the article at Rewire that sure. you did? Sure. It's called "How False Narratives of Margaret Sanger Are Being Used to Shame Black Women." Um, but I am pleased to say that if you Google Margaret Sanger, that article is like number four on the Google page results. Love it. So Love yeah, it. Can, I'm trying I to knock out. I recommend uh, it enough. It it was just things that I had never ever um, heard, and I think it's it's really very helpful in understanding exactly what Margaret Sanger's role was, and then also debunking some of the myths. And I have to say, um, thank you so much for your answer. It's so awesome. But I'm always struck by the fact that um, that you don't see these pro-life um, feminists actually doing work on reparations for people who were the victim of some of the eugenics projects that took place um, right. through state government. So that always strikes me as excuse me, is very hypocritical. Um, so I wanted to move on. Um, I have another question. So why do you think that people within the pro-choice movement feel uncomfortable saying that you can't be pro-life and feminist? I think it's sort of just our, our temperament, right? I think we as pro-choice people don't like to speak in absolutes. We like to be inclusive of everybody. We like to hear different points of view. At least I am that sort of person. I know that you and Aaron and Hannah are as well. You know, mm -hmm. we don't want to be seen as gatekeepers to some exclusive club that you have to have the secret handshake in order to be involved mm -hmm. in. You know, we want feminism to be, as Bell Hooks, you know, succinctly put it, for everybody. But at, at the end of the day, feminism isn't for everybody. Like, it's not for anti-feminists. It's not for people who adhere to anti-feminist views. And if you are of the mind that, that it is okay for you as a quote-unquote pro-life feminist to dictate what somebody else is going to do with their body and to strip another woman of their agency and their, their right to choose to have an abortion, to not have an abortion, to raise kids, to not, have ki to not raise kids, whatever, if you think that you should have some, some role in that decision-making process, that is fundamentally anti-feminist. And then feminism just isn't for you. Um, at least not the feminist, not the feminism that I adhere to. I, I do notice a lot of times that these pro-life feminists like to quote or like to hearken back to what they call um, the quote-unquote original feminists or the founders of American feminism. And mm -hmm. they're talking about people like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony and Alice Paul, you know, and Mary Wollstonecraft. And it's like, those aren't even my feminists. As a black woman, <laughs> those feminists have very little to do with me. So... You know, my feminism is founded in Ida B. Wells and Sojourner Truth and later on Patricia Hill Collins and Angela Davis and Bell Hooks. So, I mean, if, if pro-life feminists are insistent upon calling themselves feminists, then they can have that really, really white feminism that, you know, that, that they seem to love and that a lot of non-intersectionalist, non-intersectional feminists seem to love. But that's not my feminism and that really has nothing to do with me. So, you know, if they want that, they can keep it, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, I have one final question, and and I and I have to preface this with, I'm from Missouri, and so we um, we have to apologize for uh, Phyllis Schlafly, and, but you know, I I grew up kind of hearing arguments and debates um, about you know that are centered in. 
Phyllis Schlafly's platform, which is that women need to return to the kitchen and um, and just basically have a very submissive role, um, even though she herself is quite accomplished and quite educated and has a quite a extensive career. But I mentioned that just because I'm curious. It seems that you were talking about how these pro-life feminists um, kind of harken back to you know abolition era feminism and they and then we have this big shift that happened in in response to feminism that was basically going after and directly attacking feminism and you saw conservatives you know a lot of conservative women just basically um, act as if feminism was the worst thing ever so what do you think has inspired this new pivot um, of the pro-life movement back into feminism or or to actually embrace feminism it might be a new embracing and what purpose does it serve uh, well I think that um, you know all the tumblr pages where women post pictures of themselves saying I'm not a victim and I don't whine about not getting paid enough and what have you feminism is sort of popular like it's sort of this cultural touchstone that's, that you know, supposedly brings women of all stripes, races, creeds, ability levels, all of these things together. And I think that pro, you know, these pro-life feminists saw the feminist movement as being very culturally relevant and probably feeling a bit left out of that. So wanting to sort of carve out a space for themselves where they can appropriate the language, they can appropriate the, the, you know, the sort of zeitgeist of feminism while really perverting it at the same time. Um, and I also think that, you know, in this day and age to say, you know, I'm not a feminist, I mean, there are definitely people who do that, as we've seen on social media, but it's truly bizarre because I think most people at a base level have an understanding that feminism is about equality. You know, whether or not you believe, whether or not you think that, that you, you define equality in the same way as other feminists do, there's an understanding that feminism means I can do what a man can do, or I can be as good as a man can. And that's sort of a really kind of um, unhealthy way to put it, because I prefer couching it in terms of equality and doing women living their best lives as being feminism, as opposed to trying to be like men, because that's a different, that's a diff different webinar. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I think that, you know, it became sort of tragic that there were women who were so committed to patriarchy that they discounted the label of feminism. So rather than discounting the label of feminism, they adopted feminism, but also brought with them their all of their patriarchal nonsense. Mm. Um, and so I think that I think for them it serves a purpose of them being culturally relevant, of them being able to speak the language that the feminists speak, and to sort of take advantage of this 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 zeitgeist, this moment, but at the same time, you know, their sort of feminism is not really about concern for women, which is what feminism is about. It's about disdain for women. Um, mm -hmm. And before they began facing this feminism, it was very outwardly about disdain for women, as um, I believe Erin was saying at the top, um, you know, where they were calling women baby killers and murderers and then, you know, bombing clinics and, and you know, picketing people's houses. But as that sort of, as they sort of lost the middle of America, as you know, more and more people became more and more pro-choice, I think they realized that they needed to soften their approach. And so they see feminism as this sort of soft approach. I mean, they're obviously not talking about radical feminism, but they see it as, you know, this sort of, hey, let's all hold hands and talk about our vaginas and how great we are, and <laughs> let's get back to Mother Earth and the womb, and you know, let's go back to the kitchen and make martinis for our husbands. It's this very patriarchal, bizarre feminism that they have embraced, but they have done it in such a way that they've perverted feminism entirely so they can take the name and the label and all of the good things that come with that while sort of hiding the patriarchal crap that they have brought with them from their anti-feminism. Imani, thank you so much. <laughs> so thank hang you. on, um, we're going to take care of a little bit of business and then we're going to bring you back for some questions and I can already see that questions are popping up in the question tab. So um, thank you so much. Thank you. Erin? This has been an amazing discussion. I can't wait to go into the questions. Um, but first, I must plug our Repro Action campaign. 
Please, if you have not already done so, sign up for our alerts at www.reproaction.org. That is the best way to ensure that you'll never miss a thing, including a recording of this webinar that we hope you'll share. Um, follow us on social media. We are ReproAction on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And I also want to encourage you to visit and share graphics from our Who is Closing Abortion Clinics.org uh, campaign website. Um, like I said there, we dive into um, the myths that the people closing abortion clinics said they were concerned with women's health and safety when that is just a complete and utter total lie. Um, and there's more facts there and posts and things. So feel free to go there. Um, the next thing I want to do is encourage you to save the date for our next Act and Learn webinar. We run these every single month, and the purpose of them is to dig deeper into topics that um, activists and others in the reproductive health rights and justice community might have questions about, but also to share strategies, what's working around the country, what isn't, um, and whatnot. Um, next month, we're meeting on Tuesday, August 2nd from 7 to 8 Eastern, and we're just going to have a frank discussion about what abortion really is. Um, there is a lot of misinformation out there about what an abortion is really like, so we're going to demystify the abortion procedure. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to toss it back to Pamela to uh, moderate our Q&A, and I'm also going to um, unmute Hannah and Imani um, as well. So let's get going. Thank you. Um, so there's this really awesome quote from Bell Hooks, um, Feminism is for Everybody, and I'm going to read it just for people who might be visually impaired. Um, the quote is, a woman can insist she would never choose to have an abortion while affirming her support of the right of women to choose and still be an advocate of feminist politics. She cannot be anti-abortion and an advocate of feminism. I love that quote. I love everything about Bell Hooks. So um, let's dive right in. Um, so we have a question from Morgan. Um, uh, and I'm going to toss this out to Hannah first, and then Amani, you can weigh in. In light of the SCOTUS decision, is it clear or are there signs about which direction the anti-choice movement might go regarding new types of legislation? Um, and in, in, light, uh, in line with Hannah's comments about the antis embracing essentialism, is there anything the antis are saying that might suggest how they'll use this discourse to restrict abortion rights and beyond? Um, sure, this is Hannah. I can, I can uh, jump on that very quickly. Um, one of the things we've seen is the, the whole women's health decision dealt specifically with a trap law, um, which is targeted regulation of abortion providers. So it was a law that had to do with a clinic and sort of the physical uh, aspects of a clinic. What I'm seeing more and more of is the anti-choicers pivoting towards focusing really on legislation that um, is less about the clinic and more about women and the procedure itself. So what we saw even before the whole women's health decision came down was, and, and they've been doing this for years, but a lot of pushes for 20-week abortion bans, um, bills that focus on uh, fetal anomalies um, or, uh, you know, anything that has to do less with, like, the physical structure of a clinic because that is where they really fell short in the whole women's health case. That doesn't mean that they there aren't still trap laws in the books. There are. They're everywhere. Um, and they won't still try to push versions of that. But I think that that is a reasonable um, pivot that we might see from them where they're going to start to focus more on these laws and legislations that really, um, again, target women's bodies. And to be honest, I think that that is a great opportunity for us um, as the pro-choice movement to talk about, okay, this really undermines your whole feminist BS if what you're doing is focusing on these laws and these state legislation that, you know, again, control women's bodies. Mm. Imani, you want to weigh in? Yeah, I think I absolutely agree with everything that Hannah said. I think they're definitely going to be focusing more on, on the procedures. You're seeing a lot of these dilation evacuation bans. We're going to see more 20-week abortion bans. Um, I believe we're going to start seeing a lot more six and twelve week abortion bans. You know these so-called heartbeat bans. 
And I think that's primarily because Whole Woman's Health really made it clear that the Supreme Court is going to weigh in on its own when it comes to finding, to, when it comes to fact finding in these cases, and when it comes to scientific findings. I mean, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, which was the lower court, really just relied on whatever the Texas legislature said when it came to the scientific and the public health basis for the law, for, for HB2 and those particular provisions. Um, and Breyer basically said, no, um, we are going to actually examine what it is that Texas put forth in terms of evidence as to why this is necessary to advance women's health. And if there is no actual evidence there, or if that evidence turns out to be faulty or false or wrong, as a lot of the evidence regarding abortion complication rates that was submitted in Texas turned out to be, then we are going to ignore that evidence and we are going to use our best judgment. Um, and so I think in light of that, we're going to see a refocusing on the science. We're going to see them trying to roll back the point of fetal, fetal viability because that is the point at which a state has a greater interest in, they can you know, ban abortion or have a greater interest in banning abortion. So if we can get fetal viability rolled back from 24 weeks to 20 weeks to 12, you know, 18, 12, whatever, I think that's what they're going to try to do next. Got it. Thank you. Um, so we have a question um, from Teddy. Um, how much is pro-life feminism influenced by evangelical and fundamentalist Christianity? Okay. Anna? Anna? <laughs> I really can't weigh in because I don't. I, my mom's a Jew, so <laughs> I don't really know. <laughs> I mean, aside from what I've read, so. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that it um, is really heavily influenced, and I think that that's where we start to see some really um, interesting uh, overlap with um, sort of the pro-life feminist, quote-unquote, and again, the larger pro-life movement, um, which is uh, largely um, controlled by the Christian church, um, is largely evangelical, um, and so there is a lot of overlap there. Um, and when I see a lot of this... Uh, you know, anti-choice feminism rhetoric that is focused on, um, you know, women as mothers, that has a very clear connection to a lot of um, Christian rhetoric, obviously, right? Um, and, and religious rhetoric across the board. Um, I think that they are smart about the fact that being so tied to the church has really hurt the pro-life movement in general. And so a lot of these uh, groups that are trying this rebrand that we've been talking about are trying to distance themselves a little bit, um, but they're really not doing a great job of it. And and a lot of the times when I um, when I study these groups or I, I dig into them, what you see is a lot of that um, that same old uh, really um, evangelical rhetoric. And I want to be clear that I think you can you know be religious, be Christian, be evangelical, and be a feminist and be pro-choice, right? Like those things are not um, mutually exclusive, but unfortunately in the way the pro-life movement uses that religion um, and uses that rhetoric, it becomes inherently tied to their goals. Got it. And I just want to just, another question just to tag on to that. Um, so it occurs to me, I know uh, some, it was a few years back, but not that far along that we saw several attempts to um, ban birth control and um, viewing birth control like the pill and emergency contraception as as the same as abortion and that was very clearly influenced by um, by some evangelical uh, leaders and organizations. So do you see that as a trend that's kind of seen its day or is because it, it obviously is so based in, in spiritual or, or religious doctrine or do you think that that is kind of floating there and could come back? Oh, I think it's definitely uh, here to stay and, and could come back. I think that um, uh, they're getting smarter about moving away from language like abstinence uh, but they are still very much anti-birth control. Um, and that what we're seeing is we're actually seeing a lot of um, uh, pushes from them in very interesting ways to talk about how birth control is sort of an unnatural chemical. And what they really want is to get women away from, you know, hormones and get women away from this birth control that, that is really hurting you, they claim, um, towards uh, systems where you don't have to be on the pill. 
Um, so that might be uh, charting for people who are familiar with that. Um, you know, even for, for those of you who know what the rhythm method is, that's something I've seen mentioned a couple times. And it sounds ridiculous um, to people who understand the science and understand that, you know, birth control is a freeing thing, right? It, it gave women um, control over their bodies. Uh, and, and that these other methods are uh, hugely um, unsuccessful. Like, they have huge rates of... Um, you know, unplanned pregnancies happening on them, unfortunately. And so uh, I think it, again, is a really disingenuous push from them, but um, they are very much still anti-birth control, and they're just using uh, new language to talk about that. Two, if I could just talk about for a second, um, just on the sort of legal side of these things, I think, again, you know, the decision that we got in Whole Women's Health and how focused it was on science and actual fact as opposed to a lot of the junk science and just conjecture that anti-choicers like to put forward, I think we may see a revisiting, or at least I hope that we see a revisiting of this idea that, you know, a litigant can, you know, and usually a Christian evangelical litigant can come to court and say, I don't want to have to provide birth control because I believe it's an abortive fashion. Mm -hmm. Well, you can believe whatever you like, but Birth control is not an abortive fashion. Emergency contraception is not an abortive fashion. You should not be permitted to withhold non-abortive fashions on the basis that they're an abortive fashion because of your religious beliefs. That's just something that should not be tolerated. And I'm comforted that, you know, given Justice Breyer's opinion, there may be a place for science to make a comeback in the courts, and we desperately need that. Mm. Two additional points. This is Erin. I'd love to weigh in on just Lisa B., conservative, religious fundamentalism as it relates to the role of women in this rebrand. One, there's this notion that you'll hear sometimes that I think there's a very strong parallel to what's happening with this attempt to co-opt the label of feminism and paint it pro-life. Um, with this notion of what you'll hear folks say who would deeply restrict women, sometimes they use the term complementarity. So basically it's this idea that um, that men and women should complement each other and um, with with women's unique gifts as they see it, there come responsibilities and roles. And so you see this pro-life feminism as it's been discussed really elevating this idea of motherhood as woman's natural role. And then just the other thing that I want people to be aware of in terms of the history of the movement um, and the, the pro-life movement these rebrands are not uncommon, and actually very similarly, the National Right to Life Committee was a spinoff. It, it, when it launched, it was actually part of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, and so um, it was part of that, that all-male hierarchy, and they intentionally distanced themselves from it um, as part of a branding effort. So again, I just think that people should be aware that this idea of rebranding and trying to step away from the all male hierarchy or um, a very male dominated movement is nothing new. Good point. Good point. Um, thank you all for that. So I think we have time for one more question. We have a question from Allison. Um, so when they say that abortion harms women, what kind of harm do you think they mean? And when you shoot back the safety stats, they seem to shift the goalposts from medical harm to spiritual or emotional harm with ease. You know, you just need to tell them that there is no real evidence of, of overwhelming spiritual or medical harm to women as a result of abortion. You know, they went on this um, sort of campaign to collect these post-abortion trauma or post-abortion syndrome um, stories from women, women who would have, you know, panic attacks when they heard the sound of a vacuum cleaner and women who, you know, fell into drugs and alcohol because of the abortion that they had. And that is not to say that there are not women out there who do suffer those consequences as a result of choosing an abortion or choosing to terminate a pregnancy. But as Aaron said at the beginning, 95% of women don't have any regrets about it. And to throw another stat at you, 60% of women who get abortions already have children. So this idea, you know, and they've chosen to get an abortion for whatever reason it is, but but primarily it's financial because this country is not a very, it's not a very friendly birthing environment for a lot of women. So this idea that abortion is causing these horrible traumas and causing women to throw themselves off of buildings out of despair, it's just a myth. It's a lie. 
And if they try to shift the goalposts, just keep, if you hit them with facts, they may not absorb them, but maybe someone who's watching you argue with this person will. I mean, these myths that they tell are easily debunkable. Thank you. Does anybody else want to weigh in? I agree with what Amani said, and I think that, you know, one of the things that we, we see with them is that they're going to move the goalposts on every topic, right? It's not just this. It's going to be um, anything that you push back on. Um, they're, they're going to find some new uh, way to, to talk about it. Again, it's, it, they're really good at rebranding, as Aaron said, and so uh, staying on top of that and paying attention, that's, that's the best we can do. Awesome. So we are at 8 o'clock Eastern, 7 o'clock my time, and I would just like to say thank you again to our guests, Hannah Groach Begley and Imani Gandhi. Thank you so much for joining us, and thank you to all of our attendees. That, um, that concludes tonight's webinar.